right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Harry S. Dent Jr. I want to actually read from this because I don't want to get anything wrong with a guy like this, right? <laughs> Harry Dent's the founder of H.S. Dent, an economic research firm specializing in demographic trends. His mission is helping people understand change. If you've read any of his books, you know that. Using years of hands-on experience in the late 1980s, Harry developed a new way of understanding the economy and forecasting what lies ahead based on consumers, which he outlined in his book, The Great Boom Ahead, in late 92. In that book, he, he stood virtually alone in accurately forecasting an unanticipated boom of the 1990s and even called for the next Great Depression to start in 2008, which I was very upset with. De Dennis offered several bestsellers, including The Great Depression Ahead in 2008. He keeps his audience informed through monthly newsletter, The HS10 Forecast. In his latest 2000 book, The Great Crash Ahead, he outlines why government stimulus is doomed to failure and the economic havoc that lies ahead. Now, he regularly lends his economic expertise to media on television, print, and on the radio, and is a sought-after panelist and speaker for international forums around the world. Graduated from University of South Carolina, earning his MBA from Harvard Business School, where he was a Baker Scholar. Now, Harry has been a very, very great friend to RME. He's completely embraced all of our marketing ideas, and he's actually a big supporter of our new media platform as well, and since the proof is in the pudding, I'll play this for you. Retirees, listen up. Hi, this is economist Harry Dent. In my new book, The Great Crash Ahead, Strategies for a World Turned Upside Down, I show why the next financial crash and crisis is inevitable. Now, I'm not talking about the recession of 2008. This one is coming between now and early 2015. But let me be clear, you do have options. You're encouraged to seek professional retirement counseling from Wally Mackey, president of Sycamore Group Incorporated, well known for his registered trademark, money strategies using something guaranteed safe. This is an historic event which threatens your retirement wealth and you should act quickly to avoid massive losses. Wally Mackey offers a free written retirement plan, a profitable strategy specifically designed to double your wealth during this declining economy. Log on, somethingguaranteedsafe.com or call 800-217-1556 for a free DVD and information kit. That's somethingguaranteedsafe.com or 800-217-1556. 800-217-1556 for details. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Harry Dash. Thanks and good morning. How many people like this economy and love these markets? <laughs> okay, a few. Good for you. This is not what most financial advisors sign up for. Okay? And the only consolation I can give you today is that you'll only see this economy, these type of markets. We call it the coma economy and the markets on track. You'll only see that once in your life. The last time you saw it was the 1930s. And there's a reason for this. There's a demographic reason. There's a debt reason. 92 million baby boomers are going to spend less money no matter what the government does. And there are a lot of other Democrats still in school and not even in the workforce yet. So how are they going to turn around this economy? Answer is not. $42 trillion in debt, not government debt, private debt. The greatest debt bubble in history says. Good luck trying to fight this with trillions of dollars. So this is happening for a reason. We call it the winter season of our economy. We have seasons every 80 years, one human lifetime. That's why you're only going to see this once in a lifetime. But it is difficult. You cannot go out to your clients and say, well, don't worry, the markets will come back. Well, guess the last time we had a crisis like this, 1929, the markets peaked. Guess when they came back to those levels again? 1953 adjusted for inflation. 24 years later, 68 markets peak. When do they come back? 1993, 25 years later. You will be roasted and hated by your clients for all of eternity if you tell them that. Class out of asset allocation. Hey, we'll diversify you, it'll be okay. What happened in 2008? Anybody sit through that one? What didn't go down? The U.S. dollar and treasury bonds, everything else went down. Real estate, commodities, gold, silver, oil. International stocks, U.S. stocks, small caps, large caps, utilities. Everything went down. This is a bubble deflating. So we'll look at this. Before I get started, one thing. The women in the audience will tend to get what I say a little quicker than the men. There's two reasons for that. One is that we literally explain the economy in 
terms, family life cycle, bringing up kids, spending money. So women get that right away. The second reason is men tend to think they understand and know things already. I mean, evolution's kind of taught men, if you don't look like you know what you're doing, you don't get laid, okay? So men, whether you're talking about politics or economics, they, they already got it. No matter how lost a man gets, right? Will they ever ask for directions? Never. Never ask for directions. So we ask the men, just spend what you know. If you think economics is because of this, why? The, I took economics in school. I'm telling you, it was almost worthless. Nothing we use today stems from traditional economics. The other thing we tell financial advisors, especially in the long term, and that's your biggest job, helping people plan for everything from college to retirement and everything else. The key is to get the long-term trends right, and the secret is that's easy. Economists don't think that way. Economists tell you nobody can predict the economy past the next election, the next few years. Why? Economy's changing faster than ever, globalization, technology changing faster than ever. The truth is, from our view and from my research, economists don't really understand the economy. Anybody known an economist ever run a business? Really been involved in the real guts and trenches? They do a lot of great analysis. We use a lot of it where it's appropriate. They end up, though, from my view, especially from a more business background, they end up focusing on the symptoms and not the real causes of economic growth. And, and, and they have all their complex little individual indicators, and they get so down in those that they end up missing the simple, obvious forest for the tree. A friend of mine put it this way, he said, economists are people who aspired to be accountants, but just didn't have the personality. <laughs> so I don't recommend you listen to economists. Most economists are telling people the government's doing the right thing, it's okay. They're printing trillions of dollars out of thin air, but that's okay, they need to. Warren Buffett, what did they do? Somebody dragged this guy off, knocked him out, and put a chip in his head, or drugged him or something. Warren Buffett, one of the smartest guys, long-term, pragmatic, down-to-earth, realistic guy, telling the American public, it's okay. Here's my theory, if it's okay, money, every time economy goes down and you just throw in another trillion. If that's okay, and there's no real consequences to printing money out of thin air, then why don't we just print $16 trillion and pay off the damn government debt and be done with it? This is how crazy things are. People are nuts. Now, when people are watching other people go nuts, they say those people are nuts, but when everybody's nuts at the same time, it's normal happening right now. There is this mass illusion. Economists, politicians, Warren Buffett, many people, even a lot of business people, who have this illusion that if we can just stimulate a little longer, the economy will get back to normal. It's not getting back to normal. We're five years into this thing, and we're not back to normal. We are on life support, an economy in a coma on life support. And if it weren't for a trillion dollars a year in money printing and endless bailouts and fixes and this, we'd be in what? We'd be in a depression. Actually, we'd be over it by now. And we'd probably be 10, 15, 20 trillion lighter in debt instead of higher in debt. If you're, let's say you go out last night in Tampa. We got the worst food for any big city in the nation. And you ate some of our, you, you tried sushi in Tampa, okay? And you got really, really sick. What would your body's response be after evolving for thousands and zillions of years? What would your body do? Flush it out as fast as possible. Body's not stupid. If it's poisonous, if it's something toxic, if it's something bad for you, get it out. That's what our economy tried to do in 2008. And government said, no. We're not going to let the economy melt down. Why? Ben Bernanke and all of his academic perverted wisdom 
studied the Great Depression. He studied. Knows how bad when debt deleverages. But in three years, in the early 30s, our debt to GDP went, ratios went from two times GDP down to 60%. We flushed zillions of debt out of our economy. Now, did we come out of that strong? We came out of that so strong you couldn't even see the dust. We don't ever come out. Roosevelt came in after the crisis was over. The banks had totally failed, 25% unemployment. He could have been drunk asleep and the economy would have recovered. The economy knows how to fix itself. Governments are saying, no, we know better. This is not going to end well. Now, to economists who say, oh, nobody can predict the future, well, look at this. Here's a simple indicator. Average person peaks in spending at age 40 on the note. I you know. Age 78.6. That's how accurate you can be about the average person, individual. Just remember, 46 years. Here's the type of correlation you get long term with the economy. This is how we predicted in 1988 that our economy would peak around 2007 and go into a slowdown into 2020 to 23. It's just a 46 year lag. Who can't understand that? New generations raising their kids, spending a fortune to raise their kids, and then their kids leave the nest and they do what? They don't spend anymore. What pervert could spend as much on your raising your kids? Cruises can you go on, right? The problem with this graph, the blue line, which is the Dow adjusted. In the short term, this thing's a roller coaster in booms and busts. The hard thing to predict is the short term. In my newsletter, I spend 60, 70% of my time on just short-term stuff. Are we overbought or are we oversold? Did this happen? Is the Fed going to do that? Long-term is a piece of cake. But you need to give your client a vision of the long-term. We tell you that you can tell your client, show them the key economic trends that impact life, business, kids, their investment, the rest of their lifetime. This is time for just about I know. And are we going to have a boom to follow this? Yes. Is that next generation bigger? No. Every day I have to listen to idiots on CNBC, the few that talk about demographics, every single time misquote it. Oh, the echo boom generation is larger than the baby boom. No, it's not, even when you include all the immigrants. We can tell when the average immigrant was born. And something that people don't real estate, realize about real estate, we look at buying at 42 peak and buying, and there's waves of buying. But when you have a generation that's smaller following a larger one, you have to start worrying about people dying. Because when people die or move in a nursing home, that house comes up as if, hey, here's a house. We don't need to build another one. We got to vacate. We're going to see dyers start to outweigh buyers for the first time in history. Japan's real estate has been down 21 And everybody in this country, what? First of all, they thought real estate could never go down. Wrong. Second, they think it's going to come roaring back when it comes back. It's not. We could get away in this country for decades and never build one single new home except some new area that people move in. Because there'll be more people dying freeing up homes than young people needing to have a baby and buy a home. Again, this is a theory. Facts. We get this every year. Of the workforce age 20. Kids buy houses, do all this stuff, get them educated. Peaks at 46, kind of plateaus at 50. Like a it's an important thing. Drops like a rock. It actually drops as much or more as it came up. So the Fed doesn't know this. They just think economy slow. We'll throw in some free money. Little little dip. Financial crisis. No, they're going to be fighting this until the next generation comes along, and is the next generation big enough to offset that? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Okay, real quickly, a couple things. He's talking about our border, immigration affecting this. Immigration's already in that last graph. Past and future forecast. The rest of the world. Okay, for certain companies, a lot of our large companies, the world's their market. And they'd have to look at a global indicator, but for our economy, Japan, 
has had a 22-year crash now in stocks and real estate. And the world's growing. The world was particularly growing in the 90s when they had their biggest crash. So when your consumers stop spending, most of the companies' earnings slow, price, mul price earnings multiples go down, boom. All it takes for a stock crash is price earnings 15 to 7, long-term downturns. Depending on who you are, the right company can be saying, yeah, we're slowing in the U.S., but we're growing in Indonesia and China. There's a problem with that theory. That's a cold weather in the world. They get pneumonia. Guess which stock market went down more than any stock market in the world in 2008? China. 12% growth to 6% growth. Their stocks crashed 70% because they bubbled up more, and we're the dog, they're the tail. So you have to take that into account. Inflation is affected, as we know. Monetary policy, food prices, oil prices, booms and busts in the economy, all this stuff. Yet one simple indicator, labor force growth in a two and a half year life, will tell you two and a half years in advance kind of where inflation's going. And if we look well into the future, we can project the number of 20 year olds that are gonna enter the workforce on average and the number of 63-year-olds that are going to exit and retire. Now, I think that's going to change in the future. I think 20-year-olds are going to have a harder time finding a job, and baby boomers are going to stay in the workforce forever, and young people are going to start shooting us to get rid of us. That's what they did in the Great Depression. Social Security was an early retirement plan. It was not a 20-year play shuffleboard plan. People didn't live that long back then. They just wanted to give the incentive for the old people to get out so the young people could finally get a job. So we not only said decades ago that we'd see a peak in the economy somewhere around 2007 on a downturn, we said we'd go from higher inflation to lower inflation near zero, and then we'd enter a period of deflation as baby boomers started. Same thing, dyers versus workers. More people dying than new workers entering the workforce. The workforce shrinks. And Mitt Romney was going to create what was it, 12 million jobs, 4 million jobs, and I don't know, 12 million jobs in his first four years. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard from a smart person. Because, I mean, it's hard to criticize a guy who made $350 million, had perfect teeth, <laughs> had one drink in his life in high school. But it's a stupid thing to say. We're going to go to creating almost no jobs in the next decade. We're not going to have, again, not only are baby boomers going to spend less, we're not going to be creating jobs to drive a growing economy. There's no way out of this mess, is the conclusion. So labor force growth, same thing with a few tweaks. And the same thing also, the trend, it follows absolutely, unbelievably long term, but the short term can vary very significantly. So again, long term is a piece of cake. Short term, much more difficult. That's why we have risk management and try to deal with this as best we can. So what do we have to understand as financial advisors? Demographics, it is the single most important factor driving our economy, and economists know nothing about it, except they do know there's gonna be less young people to pay Social Security and healthcare for old people. That's the only thing they understand about demographics. Debt. Not just government debt, private debt is three times government debt in most countries, and we had the biggest debt bubble in history around real estate, which doubled or tripled in six years in most countries. Doubled or tripled in six years. Is that a good thing? Is that nuts? I couldn't talk one single freaking person out of buying real estate in Miami between 2002 and 2005. My wife was called the mayor of Miami when I moved there. We knew, she knew tons of people. We warned hundreds of people. Not one single person sold one condo or house because they said real estate could never go down in Miami. We'll look at that. And deflation. This is the most important factor. The people out there that agree with us that are also nutcases, gold bugs, Peter Schiff, all these people, they say government's printing tons of money, which they are, we got a big banking and debt crisis, which we're not going to get, which we agree. They say we're going to get hyperinflation, so you got to buy gold, short the U.S. dollar. And in 2008, how did that strategy work? Ooh, ouch. That, that was painful. Deflation comes from the deleveraging of private debt. 
every major debt bubble in history, without exception in major countries, has been followed by deflation, not inflation. And everybody's expecting inflation. Hardest thing for me to talk people out of. So demographics. People do predictable things as they age. Therefore, we can predict trends, not years, but decades in advance. How about this for buy and hold? As I said earlier, peak in 29, the market, just like this, crash, bubble up, crash, even you know, bear market bubbles, crash, bubble, crash. Markets went sideways to down for 12, 13, 14 years, and then we had the next long-term boom. And then again, crash, bubble, crash, bubble, crash. Vol high volatility, markets don't get back to where they peaked for 23, 25 years, and then we've just seen the last boom. So we're not coming back here for a long time. And you think real estate's gonna ever get back to 2006 level prices? It will not happen in our entire lifetime and maybe not in our kids' lifetimes, maybe not. So it's a new normal. But here's the thing, Bill Gross says, new normal is 2% on bonds, 4% on stocks. That might be close to right on average, but here's the new normal, roller coaster economy. Markets on crack, fed by stimulus, Zoom it up, it's artificial, it doesn't work that long, then you crash again, and then the government stimulate again. Japan's been doing this for 20 some years. That's the new normal. So babies are the key to our future. Anybody think of a large, high growth country in the world not having babies? China? Everybody thinks China's gonna grow forever. They haven't have been having babies for 40, 50 years now. They're going to slow down demographically faster than the U.S. and parts of Europe. Not yet. They're going to kind of plateau 2015 to 25. They are not going to be the growth engine of the future. Japan. They came out of nowhere, looked like they're going to take over the world, and suddenly flamed out. No babies. They peaked before us. We're the only people in the entire world, I think, that predicted the Japan decline before it happened in the late 80s. There were some people that predicted the strong boom of the 90s, Sir John Temple and a few like that, but nobody saw Japan going down. No babies. I was just in Korea, 2018 on. They go over the demographic cliff, we call it. When the largest generation in history peaks, crashes, next generation's not as large. There's only a few countries like Australia and a few Scandinavian countries that have an echo boom generation it's a little larger than baby boom. Every other major country, they're smaller. So a new world. So this is our leading indicator, not just for stocks and the economy, for everything. Inflation on a 20-year lag. People do predictable things from cradle to grave. They get married, they enter the workforce age 20. That puts an end to the inflation cycle. Why do young people cause inflation? Anybody know? Young people cause inflation. Oil prices go up and down. Young people cause inflation. Why? They cost everything and produce nothing. Is that good enough explanation? <laughs> Anybody disagree with that? Unless you got one of these super kids that you know, starts a popsicle stand and turns it into a franchise by age 19. Kids cost everything and produce almost nothing. <laughs> when people enter the workforce, age 20, get married, 26, have their average kid, 28, and the kids drive the cycle from there on. Kids are everything. When do they need the most childcare? Five years later before they enter elementary school, 33. When do they buy their first home? 31, soon as they can after they have kids. When do they buy their biggest home? 42, but before that, age 40. Camping equipment, this is how detailed it gets. Camping equipment peaks at age 40, why? That's when your beautiful young kids or about to turn a teenager and say, screw you, I never want to be seen with you ever again, not even by a bear in the woods, okay? <laughs> age 42, a few years later, calorie cycle peaks. Age 14, plus 28, 42, potato chips, junk foods, grocery stores peak. 46, spending peaks all together. 50 to 52 for automobiles, a little later. People furnish their car, their houses a bit, buy some living room furniture, redo their kitchen, bathrooms. They travel. Long-term travel, travel agents. Long-term travel, going overseas, seeing the world, peaks around age 54. 
46, your kids leave the nest. 54, you travel for eight years, then you realize travel sucks. Jet lag, customs, mugged in Barcelona. I've been mugged in Barcelona. So what do they do after that? They go on cruise ships, no jet lag, put me on this ship, stuff me with food and booze, and I'm happy. That peaks about 65. For financial advisors, life insurance peaks late 50s. Kids leave the nest, you get a little older, you start planning for your retirement. Net worth peaks age 64, one year after people retire at 63. So we got a lot of net worth building coming as the baby boomers peak. Our job as financial advisors is to make sure they don't lose it. That's the hardest part. Because they may be saving more and investing more, but if they lose most of the assets they built up in the great boom, we're going to have less to manage and they're going to be unhappy. So cradle to grave. People do all these predictable things. Before they do all these predictable things, what has to happen? Absolutely has to happen. They've got to be born, right? So the birth index is our key leading indicator. Before they're born, what absolutely has to happen? Somebody's got to have sex. So what drives the economy? Sex. <laughs> Don't you think that's why economists never figured it out, never will? <laughs> never had sex, never run a business. Do not listen to these people. There's a few of them that are good, but there aren't many. Lacey Hunt at Hoisington is one of the few economists I 100% like. So not just the economy cradle to grave, spending, borrowing, different sectors, housing. And housing is going to be the most affected single industry by this demographic cliff. Japan, they had a bubble before us. Why? Their baby boom peaked in spending between 1989 and 1996, two peaks, and then went off the cliff. Their markets followed consumer spending down. The consumer spending slowed down first, which we could predict with demographics. On a lag, first downturn they did, yes, on a lag. After the first crash and they went down again, they started doing endless quantitative easing. Japan, if you compare the size of their economy to ours, and just for that, they have done over $5 trillion in quantitative easing compared to our two. Now, they've been doing it over a longer period of time. So Japan did consistent quantitative easing since the late 90s, and not quite as big as Europe and the U.S. because they didn't have as big a crisis. Japan was lucky. They went through their debt deleveraging, their demographic cliff, when the rest of the world was booming. That makes it easier. Export industries are still doing well. Every government's doing this. You've got to remember that Keynesian economics was invented in the Depression by Keynes after it happened. And it took him, like it's going to take me, to sell a new obvious economic theory till I die to get economists to shift over and they didn't get accepted until the early 70s. We've been using Keynesian economics ever since. Endless budget deficits, endless trade deficits, and now in an emergency, endless quantitative easing. I agree with you. I, when I was four years old, I just loved the magic wand crap, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, the fairy comes in, waves the magic wand, all the baddies go away, and the wolves and shit, and everything's fine. <laughs> to me, life has not taught me that. You can't do something this extreme, our debt, for example, our debt in the U.S. economy and many others, from 83 to 2007 in the boom, grew at 2.7 times faster than the economy. It's not inflation that's a problem. It's not growing our money supply. Any complex economy needs more money per person to delegate more tasks and, and, and to deal. The problem is borrowing money that you don't have to spend money you don't have. Eventually, that crashes. So you can't fix that with a magic wand. Now, well, wait a minute, real quick. He's not a dumb guy, but he couldn't get laid in a whorehouse, okay? <laughs> so everybody's got their smarts, right. you know? He doesn't understand business. I spent the first part of my career turning around businesses at Bain & Company, big business, and then small new ventures. When you get out of whack, you've got to cut costs, especially fixed costs. You've got to redirect your strategies and your markets. You've got to renegotiate with creditors. You've got to sell off assets. This is what you've got to do to turn around. It's called austerity, and it works. 
Waving a magic wand does not work. Now, Japan has done this, and this is my fear. What does Japan have? 22 years after their markets peak, a coma economy, markets on crack, an aging population, and a government debt ratio that was 60% of GDP, now it's 230% and rising. Does that sound like it's going to work long term to you? A retirement home in Hawk. That's what Japan is. Japan's dead. They're never coming back because they took the easy way out. Now, they never had a Great Depression. Their markets went down 80% more. Real estate went down 60% or more. They're still down that much. They avoided the crisis, so they basically took another drug to replace the old one. They took methadone instead of heroin. Now they're hooked on the methadone, which is government debt. Consumer debt levels are the same percentage of GDP they were at the top of the boom. You've got people in Japan, and I can't go much longer than this, still paying off mortgages higher than the value of their home 20-some years later because Japanese don't have shotguns and they don't walk from the bank. They're not like Americans. We're a bunch of rednecks, okay? We just say, screw you, take the house and shove it. <laughs> Japanese is against their morals and ethics. They're still paying those mortgages. The government should have forced the banks to restructure those mortgages. That would have taken a lift. We'll talk about this more. So, four seasons. Boom, bust, boom, bust. Two generations, Bob Hope, baby boom. Inflation is what gives you. Think of inflation like temperatures. Hot is inflation, cold is deflation. In between, ah, wonderful spring and fall. So we go through this every 80 years. We've gone from the fall bubble boom season, assets get up, low interest rates, technology bubble moves mainstream. That only happens once in a lifetime, like electricity, cars, and phones back in the early 1900s, roaring 20s. And then that bubble crashes, debt gets restructured, austerity, everything freezes over. Businesses are forced to get really, really efficient and creative. This pays off long term. The spring comes from the winter. You don't go through winter, you don't get spring. Japan, 22 years later, should be in spring. Their next generation is in a spending mode, house buying mode. They're not in spring because they didn't take the medicine. That's what we're doing. That's what Europe's doing. That's scary to me. I'd rather have the crisis like we did in the early 30s and get the damn thing over it. Flush it out and go on with 50 pounds on your back instead of 250. How fast can you run with 250 pounds of debt on your back? That's what we got. Debt ratios more than double the Great Depression before we came to the Great Depression. So debt, greatest real estate bubble in history. I keep telling people, this is not a hard thing. Japan's already gone through everything the US and Europe are gonna go through. Already, already had their bubble peak in stocks and real estate, already crashed, already went off the demographic cliff, had another generation younger come along, oh, not big enough to really offset the tide, and look at Japan. So they had a bubble. 2.6 times in five, actually six years, 86 to 91. Guess what, bubbles go back, and I've, we've studied every bubble in history. Nine out of 10 of them go back to where they started or a little lower. So it depends on how extreme the bubble got. Different countries didn't have as big a bubble, didn't have big bursts. Different parts of real estate in the US didn't have as big a bubble. They're not bursting so much. We can talk about that. US, to go back to where the bubble started, We've been down 34% recently, 33. Starting to bounce a little bit. This is what they call a major bounce in housing in the media, by the way. Housing's coming back. If I'm a chartist on stocks and I saw this sort of fall and this sort of bounce, it's called a dead cap bounce, which means you're going lower. A market should bounce more than this with the lowest mortgage rates in history, with trillions of dollars of stimulus from the government. This housing market should be on fire. It's not because everybody overbought, overborrowed, and demographics say we're in a lull. Baby boomers are done, echo boomers are not quite there yet to buy houses. So we gotta go down a good bit more, maybe another 30%. I wanna see us get back to early 2000. That's where I say the bubble started. It was exactly when the tech bubble ended. People have just gone from bubble to bubble. Tech stocks, hey, let's retire flipping tech stocks. Oh crap, that didn't work. Well, real estate, that never goes down. Let's flip real estate. Oh crap, that didn't work. Now what are people buying? Gold. Who, who thinks gold's gonna go up in the next decade? Gold didn't have a chance if everybody's buying this crap on TV. Being sold by hucksters. 
How do we get this real estate bubble? Real simple. Banks went from the beginning of the bubble, January 2000, loaning, let's call it three times your income, 3.3 to 9.2 in six years. The banks went nuts. Why? The government says, we want you to do this. And the banks thought about it for a while and said, crap. I can tell you what drives our industry, financial services, the growth of debt. This is the biggest bonanza they ever got. Government's going to back our borrowing with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, buy our loans, let us lend as much as we want. Real estate never goes down. So what risk do we have? People are nuts. And when people all go nuts together, it doesn't look nuts. But it's still nuts. You got to stand back. You can't be the frog in the water saying, well, hey, things are kind of hot, but it's only a little warmer than last year. You got to look at the damn thermometer and it says 212 degrees. Get the hell out of the water. Nobody does it. Real estate's different regionally. Biggest bubbles, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Miami. California was always expensive. It just got more expensive. In between, Little Lesser, Tampa, Detroit. Well, the more it bubbles up, the more it falls. Then you got places like Denver and Dallas. They didn't get much of a correction because they didn't bubble much in the first place. So talking to your clients, clients about real estate, number one, best thing you can do is get your clients to get their damn money out of illiquid, heavy real estate and back into flexible financial assets that you can manage, number one. So talk them out of buying that vacation home, even though they're talk their kids out of buying their starter home. Talk them out of investment real estate. And the, the way you explain it is, look, here's the difference. Two bubble cities, two great demographic growth, migration, Miami and Dallas on both ends. Miami, what do you see? Ocean, Everglades, small strip of land. Everybody wants to move there from everywhere. Latin America, Europe, Northeast, Midwest. So what does the building do? It goes up. What do the prices do? Bubble. Limited development, high demographic demand. Well, you got high demographic demand in Dallas, just as fast as growth, now even faster. Why did Dallas not bubble? What's the difference in this picture here? Land. Endless land, endless flat land, plenty of rainfall. The joke in Dallas is you can watch your dog run away all day. <laughs> and it's true. It never bubbles up because you can always build another development right down the road. So Dallas didn't bubble up, won't bubble down. One of my long-term workers just bought a house in Dallas. Most people, I say, don't buy a house yet. But I said, in Dallas, you don't have a lot of downside. Go ahead. Quick. Everybody does. Go to Australia. Go to Vancouver. They, 20% down payments, higher interest rates, especially in Australia. Guess what their real estate is? Just as expensive as Miami or LA or San Francisco. Strong demographics, limited land. They're just like Miami. Actually, all of Australia is like California. Dry, mountainous ocean, limited land. They've had not only a big baby boom like us, they have massive immigration. Everybody in Asia wants to move to Australia. I would too. Australia is my favorite country in the world. It wasn't so far away, I would move there and get the hell out of here. Because we got 300 million guns now. And that's going to double in the next few weeks before they pass some laws. Everybody's going to buy two now. <laughs> so real estate. It's not one industry. Echo Boom is in apartments right now. Best place we said to be. Next move in a couple of years, starter homes start to rise. Trade up homes, McMansions are dead forever. Vacation homes have already bubbled. They're on the downside, but there'll be a second round of buying in vacation homes and retirement homes. So there's going to be opportunities in real estate, but it's not going to be in McMansions. And it's going to be different in different parts of the country. Ticking time bomb, endless foreclosures, and guess what real estate developers are doing? Building again. We got 3.6 million still in foreclosures. They're going to come on the market in the coming years. We got this demographic clip, and there's going to be more dyers than buyers after 2013. We're just doing that analysis now. And they're building again like real estate's coming back better than ever. What a bunch of freaking idiots. So do you want to be buying home building stocks? No. Worldwide bubble. Guess what? Bigger bubble in the merging world. China's going to have the biggest crash when it's all over. Most overvalued real estate in the world. Debt. At the peak, 
57 trillion. People say we got 16 trillion. No, we had 57 trillion in 2008. Government, 13, counting state and local. Financial sector, leverage, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, mortgage securities, mortgage-backed securities. This never happened before. Banks used to lend. Now imagine this in the dark ages. Banks used to lend against deposits. Now, oh, that's too much of a holdback. They borrow to lend on top of that. So we got a level of debt nobody's ever seen before. We didn't have this in the Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression. Consumers, twice as much in debt than they've ever been, even in the Roaring Twenties. Corporate, as much in debt as the Roaring Twenties. Greatest debt bubble in history. Governments don't print money, financial institutions do, with a lot of encouragement and help from the government. Oh, and unfunded entitlements? Oh, yeah, 66 trillion. Shit, I forgot about that. Now, this is not the short-term problem. This is over four decades. But this is a debt load that will not stand. If we had simply, from the beginning, adjusted Social Security and health care benefits for our increasing life expectancy, we'd be retiring at somewhere between 73 and 75 instead of 62 and 65, and we wouldn't have an entitlement problem. We're in la-la land. We were promised this shit. Nobody's thinking about the future. They never do. So this is a huge crisis. So we only have 122 trillion in debt, give or take a couple trillion. Anybody think this is enough? Well, wait a minute. Why don't we add another 10 trillion in quantitative easing, a trillion a year over the next decade, to just up this a little bit? What, what's another 10 trillion going to hurt? That's my problem. You don't cure debt with more debt. I know every redneck says that, but I'm sorry, it's the truth. You don't cure debt with more debt. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. The government admits in their accounting to 50 some trillion unfunded. Outside sources, the best we found, 66. Our guess was always between 60 and 70. I was just too lazy to do that work. Government debt, financial sector debt, consumer debt, and corporate debt added up to about 57, 56, 57 trillion. Now it's actually higher. Government has added 6 trillion. Private sector has deleveraged 4, and they did all that in late 2008 before the government stopped. My thing is that. There's 42 trillion in private debt out of this 56 at the peak. A little more than half of that came in eight years under a Republican president and Congress who were supposed to be fiscally responsible. Now, did, they, did George Bush want to create a bubble in debt? No. It was already in motion, and he didn't do a damn thing to stop it. That's what happened. We've been bubbling up in debt for the whole boom, but it, it crescendos. It grows exponentially. We should be able to eliminate at least $20, $22 trillion of private debt take a trillion and a half a year of principal and interest off the consumers and business. See, that's a stimulus plan that helps the private sector. It doesn't reward banks for being a bunch of frickin' idiots and making bad loans and making more bad loans and investing on 30 to 50 times leverage, which they're still doing. Every bank has an investment arm. AIG did not go under because their insurance business. They went under because somebody speculated twice the net worth of their entire market value of their business. And we bailed them out. Oh, that's okay. Deflation. Every bubble. The bubbles always get bigger because we're able to borrow more money. 67 trillion. That's even another whole level. Can't talk about that. Debt is like a drug. It takes more and more to have less and less effect. Our debt per GDP has created less and less GDP growth, and it just went to zero recently. There's a point where adding more debt doesn't work because you can only stretch people's spending power and their debt so far before they get overloaded. People see greatest monetary stimulus in history, even greater than the Depression and World War II. This must lead to inflation. But no, the velocity of money is dropping like a rock. If it's not lent and spent and turned over, it doesn't turn into inflation. Velocity of money, Lacey Hunt, long term. When you're above this line here and growing, it means you're investing in productive capacity. When you're slowing in that growth but still above the line, you're speculating. More money's going into speculation, but does not create long-term growth. And when you go below this line, you're starting to deleverage and detox. And that's what a depression is. Household net worth, first downturn. 18 trillion went poof, gone. So what's a couple trillion in stimulus? Fed's put in two trillion, out of nowhere, boom, boom, yeah. 18 trillion disappeared. 
How can they fight this? Baby boomers are going to spend trillions less over the coming decade just because they're aging, not because they're unhappy, not because they hate America. They just don't have all these kids to spend it on. Next round, there's going to be more. So money disappears. Debt deleverages. Assets disappear. This is real money to real people. Oh, my house was worth $3 million, and I'm going to retire on that when I sell it at 65. My portfolio was worth a half a million. I was going to retire on that. Now it's only worth 250 after the crash. This is real money disappears, not just debt. Our short-term indicators say the U.S. may already be slowing. We've had gyrations in earning cycles, which get bigger and bigger. Why? Markets on crack. Stimulus feeds the markets. Stimulus goes into the financial systems to keep the banks alive. The banks do not lend it out because it's not a good environment for that and there's not a lot of demand. So they turn around and reinvest it and they got to put it somewhere. So for the first time in history, over a number of years now, bonds, stocks, commodities, gold and silver all go up at the same time. It's called the risk on trade. Does that sound healthy? No. And when things burst, everything goes down. Spain's the biggest problem in the world. Most people don't realize when you have a bubble like this, an asset bubble and a debt bubble, an economy so stretched with debt and all this stuff, all it takes is something to pop the balloon. The last worldwide crash in everything got triggered by what? Anybody know what triggered it? Subprime crisis in the US. You know where that crisis hit largely? Four states. California, Nevada, Arizona, Florida, throw in Michigan maybe, four to five states. You know what those four to five states add up in real estate and population? Oh, about the same as Greece and Spain. Southern Europe would be bigger. Spain, you got bankruptcies accelerating despite massive stimulus. They had a real estate bubble that lasted three years longer, went 35% higher and is starting to unravel. And they ended up having 13% of their workforce in construction directly when we only got 5.6 or something. If we can't come out of our real estate bubble, how's Spain gonna come out? There is no way to bail out Spain. Spain is the most likely single country, along with Greece and Portugal and all those other countries there. Now it's Slovenia and Slovakia, and they're all in deep shit. Anybody ever been to these countries? I love going there because the people are so happy. But happy means lazy, not good workers. I'd go there to vacation. I wouldn't hire most people there. What's the retirement age expectation in Greece? Anybody know? 52. So they need a little correction, a little adjustment, they'd call it, in thinking. We shouldn't be retiring at 63 on average. 73 should probably be what we'd be targeting to retire. The only bubble that hadn't started to peak is China's. Look at this red line here. Look at the brown one, Spain, how much their use of cement dropped off a rock, way more than our bubble burst in the US in blue. China's the last bubble. More cranes in China than everywhere else in the world put together. Price to income ratios in Hong Kong and Shanghai are about 40 to one. They were 10 to one in San Francisco and LA, and now today in Vancouver and Sydney, Australia, before the birth. Here's my favorite chart. Despite endless quantitative easing, doing the same thing we're doing, Ch Japan's market continues to crash, rebound, and keeps crashing to slight new lows because stimulus only works so long and you can't create a real recovery out of artificial stimulus. This is an 11-year lag. It's the difference between our peak in baby boom in 1961 and their final peak in 1950. So Europe and the US are following. We are due for the next crash. We're the most overvalued now. Europe's been going down since early 2012. And if we just go to slight new lows, where does that put us? 6,000 Dow? That's all we gotta do, slight new lows. Then we'll have another boom and bubble, another grand stimulus plan. Then one more downturn, somewhere between 2019 and 22. This is following almost exactly Japan's evolution over the last 20 years. This is the megaphone pattern I talked about. Each bubble, in the S&P in this case, has taken us to a slight new high. Each crash has taken us to a slight new low. I get on CNBC and I say, gosh, in the next few years, the Dow could go back to 6,000. People go, oh my God, that's crazy. How, what, what are you smoking? And I'm like, what the hell are you smoking? This has happened for the last 20 years. Bubble burst. 
This is the simplest story. And you, as a financial advisor, whether you like it or not, and I know you don't like it, because you like asset allocation and all this crap that worked really, really good for decades, it's just not going to work in this new normal. You've got to think like a long-term trader, not short-term. When things crash, you get your clients back into more risk on assets, you need to diversify, you build them up, and when they get start to get towards the top of this, you start getting defensive. That's the best you can do. You can't call the top exactly. We'll try, but we probably won't either. Europe peaked in 2000, already seen a 60% crash, and looked like they're going towards 70 to 80%. Bonds have been going in a channel. This is our best indicator. Late 2008, we told people to get out of bonds. They're going to spike up in value. Well, now we're back near the bottom of this channel. If we see a slowdown in the first quarter, which we could in the US, bond yields go back down to 1.2, 1 1.4%. We're going to say, get out of bonds. Because default risk, another downturn, is going to cause risk to go up in treasury bonds, but much more in corporate and junk bonds. And then we'll get a spike. And then a downturn will lead to deflation again, like in 2008 and 9. And deflation will bring yields back down. So again, it's an up and down. It's a roller coaster market. It's really hard to do buy and hold in this. And it's especially hard when you diversify and everything goes down together. Stocks go down, commodities are going to go down, bonds are going to go down. Maybe not quite as exact the same time, but they're all going to go down. And real estate, too. What's the ultimate safe haven? U.S. dollar. Total misunderstanding on this topic. Total, absolute Biggest misunderstanding I've ever seen in all history among the people who agree with us. They'll show you a chart, U.S. dollar used to be worth a dollar, now it's worth three cents. Dollar in 1900, and they've de they just de debased our dollar. The dumbest freaking thing I've ever heard in my life. You know what the standard of living has gone up since 1900 in the U.S. for the average family? Eight times. You think, debased our dollar, you destroyed our purchasing power. Complex societies, we're not on the little house in the prairie anymore. That's my argument with the conservative party. They want smaller government. Yeah, I want smaller government too, but you can't go back to Andy and Mayberry. Small towns don't take much government. Small companies don't have much bureaucracy. Big companies, big cities have a lot more government and coordination. They have to. Much richer, much more trades. Trade means more money. You need more money. It's a sign of progress, as long as you're not borrowing more than you're earning. That's the catch. The dollar was devalued almost 60% in the boom because of that $42 trillion in debt and 12 in government created out of thin air. The dollar should continue to rebound when we deleverage. So the dollar, UUP or dollar index, is a good way to hedge on the downside. The dollar is going to underperform when the risk on trade on. So the risk off is the US dollar and high quality bonds. Gold. May have one bounce left in it, but we think it's the last bubble to burst. So if gold gets over 2,000, get out. If it breaks below 1520, tell your clients to get out. I think it's more likely to go up. It's the most oversold of any sector we look at right now, gold and silver. So triggers, Greece, Spain blows, US slows by Q3. We think the next recession starts the second half of the year, but not before. China's exports collapse on a lag to Europe and US greatest real estate bubble and building bubble in the world burst and look out after that because every emerging country is selling crap to China. Emerging country stock markets correlate more with commodity prices and with China's market than they do with US and Europe markets because of this commodity export. So you get a worldwide deflationary downturn, not forever, probably between mid-2013 and early 2015. Increasingly over the next Several months, sell stocks and gold, risk on assets, real estate and second homes. Again, best thing you can do is get your clients to take money out of dead real estate that is highly illiquid. The problem with real estate is once it turns sour, you're stuck with it. There are no buyers. You can sell a stock or, or, or a fund any day, even at a loss, but at least you can sell it. Talk their kids out of buying their first home because they're going to be dying to if they're late 20s. If people are looking to downsize a home, do it now. I can't talk most people out of selling their primary home and don't even want to, but a lot of people in my community are thinking of going from a 6,000 square foot home to a 3,000. I say, do that now. Don't wait till you're 65. Do it now. You cut your exposure to real estate in half. Low end homes will go down less than high end homes. Banks know this. Sell bonds that we see 
interest rates go down, or if they break up above about 2%. So it's getting close to time where it's not even that safe to hold bonds, especially corporate. Wait for major crashes again to start to reinvest. Again, think like a long-term trader. In the places I want to most invest after the next crash, the best demographics are going to be Asia, X, Japan, and China, and the healthcare, the best healthcare sectors of the U.S., medical devices, biotech, um, pharmaceuticals. People take more drugs until the day they die. There's no better long-term baby boom demographic than drugs, legal drugs, pharmaceuticals. Okay, do I have any time left for questions? Probably not.